I do have a co-chairman. You know, he was caught in the traffic just a minute ago. Now he's here. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Shaka. So the next speaker will be uh, Professor Philip Chu. Uh, he is the current professor of the Department of Surgery and Institute of uh, Digestive Disease and Director of the Center uh, for Minimal Invest Surgery Skills. Uh, he was the center for the uh, CHK Choi Ho Technology Center for Innovative Medicine, and he also served the assistant dean of medicine. So he's going to give a talk on informed consent uh, of practitioners' point of view. So welcome, Philip Chu. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Shaker for his invitation. And uh, indeed, uh, I'm a day-in, day-out practitioner to get informed consent. So hopefully, in the next uh, 15 minutes, I'm going to uh, reveal what is uh, within my practice of um, an informed consent. So um, sometimes this is a real-life situation. It's a more common 20 years ago where a nurse called doctor so-and-so, your patient's ready at the operation theater. On the table, your assistants have prepared everything for you. The only thing lacking is the consent. And when this happened, the surgeon, in his mind, will say, where is my junior? What is he doing? So, in fact, informed consent is extremely important nowadays. Maybe 20 years ago, it's just a few sentences. But nowadays, it's uh, very important that it's a process, not only signing the uh, sheet of the consent, but in order to get the permission before conducting any healthcare intervention on the patient. So the informed consent process has become a, a platform of uh, ethical and legal surgical practice and disclosing a lot of information that include the natural cause of the disease without treatment, different therapies available, the re recent um, recommendation of uh, what to choose, and the expected outcome, citing probably data from the attending surgeon if possible. So for us, we also have some pressure of getting our own data and a possible complication. <clears throat> so in the ancient time, in fact, there has already been laid down uh, what should we do for informed consent. Um, in the time of uh, Plato, uh, he written in the laws, um, one of his uh, publications, that um, free, at, the, at the time there were free people and a slave. And the free-born doctor should get gather information from the patient who is a free, free patient and friends about the illness. He should inform the patient about the nature of his illnesses and also would not give him any prescription until he had gained the patient consent. So this has already been laid since the, the era of uh, Plato. So, um, but you also have encountered some difficult situation if you're treating a important person, for example, Alexander the Great, where during his conquer, he was seriously injured in a battlefield in India, and indeed he has been seriously injured by a lot of um, different uh, situations in the battle. And a very skilled physician finally operated on Alexander because he was hit by an arrow, and, uh, but with much reservation because he was terrified about the prospect of the failure. And it was Alexander himself as a patient who understood his hesitation and encouraged him uh, to operate. So if in the extreme case, um, you can say that every single procedure has a risk, not only risking the patient, if you put yourself into this formula, then nobody will operate and bear the responsibility. So if you take it into the extremity of age, uh, of, of stage, then you can never operate on any patient. So just give you a, an example of what I daily and daily out will be practicing. Um, I just recently encountered a patient with a esophageal cancer where he has uh, been presented with progressive difficulty in swallowing for two months. And the upper endoscopy showed that there's a tumor at 25 to 30 centimeter biopsy confirmed it to be um, squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, he received a, a PET CT scan and that showed no distant metastasis and only lymph node around the esophagus. So 
During my interview to the patient, I need to clearly explain his situation, as I mentioned before, and after that, there are treatment options. And in this modern era, the treatment option is much more than what I would expect uh, when I was a trainee. When I was a trainee, perhaps um, just surgery is good enough. But then nowadays, even with surgery, I have this maximal invasive approach and a minimal invasive approach. And I can go through the chest, I can go through the abdomen only, I can do two stage, I can do three stage, and also I can use the robot to help me to do it. And also, we can give chemo radiation therapy before the treatment of surgery, or even just relying on chemo radiation therapy alone to treat this disease. So with this kind of information, it's very difficult for us to explain and also very difficult for the patient to understand completely about the treatment of choice. So logically and professionally, I believe that we should explain to the patient what is the best treatment. So nowadays, according to the literature and also the guidelines and also to uh, different meta-analysis and systematic review, we will know that in certain stage of the cancer, the best treatment is a surgery or chemo radiation therapy plus surgery. And also the patient's condition is also important in this ultra major surgery, whether we should offer them and what's the risk and the benefit. So this is uh, our current situation of um, consenting practice in the surgical ward. So normally the doctor explained to the patient, so this is a patient, you can see that she has a feeding tube because she cannot eat and this is a patient with cancer of the esophagus. So we have to get this consent form from the surgical side where you can, lay, you can see there are three pages and actually um, the uh, surgeon have to uh, sign the consent with the, the, the patient and the best situation is the relative is around and with a, um, a, a third party, usually the nurse. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the process of getting the informed consent become uh, quite complex nowadays. We have to explain the potential risk and benefit and also treat other treatment options, discuss with the patient and the family the pros and cons and decide on the treatment and share uh, this uh, decision together with the uh, whole family and the doctor. So for example, <clears throat> this is not yet an exclusive list of risks from esophagectomy. So, but these are common risks. So you can see that uh, every single risk, they are specific to the type of surgery. So nowadays, um, also, if you are not practicing that procedure commonly, I do believe that you shouldn't actually do it because in the consenting procedure, the type of risk, the odds of having that risk actually varies between different surgeons. And if you don't know, if you miss one of the major, major risks, for example, um, like a damage to the laryngeal, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve pulse, uh, causing the patient to have a palsy, the patient can have a hoarseness voice, so he or she cannot sing in the future, they have swallowing difficulty, they may even have aspiration pneumonia, so that ends up in a much, much difficulty for the patient and also for the surgeon. And uh, also, the perioperative mortality um, in the situation of esophagectomy nowadays becoming um, improved. So in the past, um, I believe that uh, 20 years ago, the perioperative mortality for esophagectomy ranges from 5 to 10% or even more in some of the institutes. But with um, the improvement in all this technology and treatment, nowadays um, at our unit, 1% um, or even less of perioperative mortality. But this is already considered as an ultra-major surgery. And also one of the points that I always mention to the patient after mentioning this risk is that um, these are only for reference because these are from the data collected in the past. A patient is their own individual. So life and death to the patient is only 0% or 100%. So the percentage doesn't really af affect what will be happening next, although you know that you can balance and whether you would be able to accept that risk, it depends on your own interpretation and knowledge. So I think multimedia now help, help me to explain the procedure because um, nowadays surgery become uh, more acceptable less blood, 
a clear review with the laparoscope and minimal invasive approach. So in fact, more than 90% of my practice is now totally minimal invasive or even endo endoscopic non-invasive. So for me, giving a video to explain the procedure actually helps. So um, this is a, a rather easy uh, for the patient to understand and accept the procedure. So because of time, I'm not going to show all the procedure. So this is a esophagectomy um, and where we collapse the lung and uh, we do lymph node dissection around the esophagus. So um, for the uh, informed consent also, who is responsible in a team-based service like in a public service? Is it anyone in the team? Is it one of the few surgeons listed on the operating list? Is it a surgeon who is operating as a chief surgeon or the most junior guy who has always been blamed and become the slave and, uh, or actually the consultant who is leading the service? So my practice is that if I'm the surgeon on this, I always get the consent or participate in the process of the consent because I'm the one finally responsible for the procedure, like ease of rejecting me. I always participate in every single consenting uh, uh, process. I think this will help. I will also give the opportunity to my junior to help in getting the consent so that they can learn. But in the private sector, I believe it's the, the surgeon who is operating. And the patient must be competent in taking the decision and uh, receive sufficient information and not act under stress. And I believe that the relative is best to be there to support and also to ensure the patient fully understand what is going to be done for him, for him or her. So it should be in a comfortable situation in a, a room or a ward where you're not disturbed and the patient can clearly hear you and uh, not under stress and allow time for them to decide. So seldom would they actually make a decision on the ward unless it's an emergency operation. So um, how do we understand that the patient fully understand? So that's also an important issue. Sometimes we are just talking and the patient have no response. So that silence doesn't mean that you are given consent. So my practice is I always ask if they have any further question that they wish to ask me, or if not, then you can still have time. If you have any doubts, please come back and tell us your question or your query. We can discuss again anything. So a, I think a skilled, skillful explanation with the consideration of the patient's background and the socially, educational or ethnic group or even the language barrier is important. So building up the rapport is again uh, very, very important for us to have a better understanding. And I think the, uh, currently we are also required to be having a much more surgical safety, not only doing the informed consent, but there's a process of the whole preoperative and postoperative surgical care as laid out by the WHO surgical safety checklist. So um, the, the WHO is now also promoting uh, patients for patient safety, PFPS, where they wish to have a communication tool to have an uh, enhancement of the surgical safety. For example, they would be uh, learning before the surgery, so what should they be um, able to ask or uh, uh, your, ask your surgeon about uh, the surgery. So in the next uh, couple of minutes, I'm going to just uh, pro, uh, throw some of the interesting or difficult situation. And uh, for example, in the extreme situation where you're on the plane and the patient developed a pneumothorax like illustrated uh, by Professor Wallace. Uh, it was a well-known case where after an examination in Hong Kong, he flew back in the British Airway um, in the 1990s, maybe 1995, so uh, back to England and on the flight, there was a lady who suffered from an injury during her travel on a motorbike to the airport and she developed pneumothorax on the plane and you have no um, guidance or experience of a new procedure of introducing the chest string uh, with a, uh, a coat hanger. So, but then he acts, and this is a good Samaritan act and help the patient. I think this is a very, very important. So the other extreme case for us in the surgeon is there's a change of plan. Shall we wake him up and ask him for the informed consent? Like in this case, this is a recently operated by me. He is a patient who presents with GI breathing, but upon introduction of an endoscopy, the abdomen suddenly blow up and with, and with, with gas, and there's an obvious perforation. 
So when we open up, this is a big tumor in the stomach, but however, this is an organ, not, not the stomach, but the liver. A tumor invaded to the liver. So we get the consent of resecting the patient's stomach because of the GI bleeding, but we don't have the consent beforehand about resecting the liver uh, on block with the uh, stomach to get a clear resection of the tumor. Shall we wake him up? So I didn't, of course, as a surgeon, I act as I needed for the best interest of the patient. The patient was discharged 10 days after the operation. But this is something that we always face, and uh, what should we do? And uh, um, uh, an interesting uh, survey about a resident or trainee participating in your surgery. So you can see that um, the response about um, informed consent processing, whether the patient is willing to consent, will become very low if they know that the residents are performing surgical procedure without staff surgeon present. So would you explain about the level of the surgeon that is operating and that may actually severely affect the uh, consenting process? And uh, you can see that the younger the age, the female gender, not knowing that that is a teaching hospital or not believing that there is a society benefit uh, if you are allow the uh, resident to operate, they are the factor that would affect the change of mind on the consenting process. So um, uh, this is my last slide. So uh, my first time of doing a lot of procedure has been uh, very common uh, uh, for the last 10 years for me. Um, I've been pioneering a lot of uh, surgical procedure in Hong Kong. For example, like this um, first case of uh, laparoscopic implantation of a stimulator to, uh, for treatment of gastroparesis is, that's never been performed for uh, non-Caucasian. So I, when I introduce this for treatment of a patient, uh, I have to go through a process of application to ethics committee and also hospital authority central technology office. But I think um, this is a very important process for me to uh, get a better understanding of our procedure and also credentialing and also to get a good informed consent for the patient. So um, in summary, informed consent is absolutely essential for performance of any surgical procedure, and the process is very important and actually uh, include uh, information given, understanding between the doctors and the patient, and finally con consenting to the most appropriate treatment. So thank you very much for your attention.